factors that would set off the cerebellar problem. We're not going to get into that, I don't think, but a cerebellar problem will cause you to have tightness in your neck versus an autoimmune problem. So I think that a lot of people come in, I'm answering the question as chiropractors, you know, why are you doing this? We're doing this because frankly, we have the best background. We get, how much do we get in, 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 in how much education do we get oh, yeah. in the musculoskeletal system versus right. the two to six hours right. that the medical model gets in their basic thing? So that answers that question. But triggers, okay, I didn't forget. So triggers are like infectious, triggers are like trauma, pregnancy, being pregnant, transferring your antibodies, from you to your child in the last trimester um, can create autoimmune issues with patients. Delivering the child seems to set off autoimmune responses. How many of you out there going, I was fine, then I had a child and I put on weight. I thought no big deal, it was gonna go away, it didn't go away, I'm tired, I never got, I never got better again. Next thing you know, I started getting these pain. Pregnancy, traumas, had one the other day, um, uh, surgery, surgery, I had hip surgery, Next thing you know, my whole body hurt. We see it a lot with peripheral neuropathy. I had a hip surgery. Next thing you know, I got pain numbness, tingling, burning in the feet. That's another thing. And stress. We talked about stress in the beginning, and I, I think that kind of covers that. covers a lot of them, yeah. Those That's are triggers. Mm -hmm. Those are triggers. People want to know the cause of fibromyalgia, but those are the triggers of fibromyalgia. And a lot of people want to know what the symptoms are. I, and I want to go over that, and then I think you really should get into, you know, the brain. Okay. Well, the brain does it, but what would you say? The symptoms of fibromyalgia, that the things that we find out are involved in fibromyalgia are usually an autoimmune problem, mm -hmm. frequently. Frequently, it's thyroid, it's gut, and for those of you that develop dizziness and vertigo and balance problems out of nowhere, cerebellum. Um, um, we, we see um, um, gut, I said that, did I say that? We, we see usually gut problems, because a lot of people who develop I have Hashimoto's, okay, that's an autoimmune attack on your thyroid. Those of you who have fibromyalgia, you should look it up. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you, or look at our last hangout, okay? And and people who have that have an awful good chance of having celiac. You eat, you have diarrhea, you eat something, you bloat. If you don't eat it, you don't bloat. Um, that, the gut has 70% of your immune system in there, it has all the chemistry, most all the chemistry that makes your brain and everything work. Gut's usually involved, most you have bad gut. Most of you have bad thyroid, most of you have an autoimmune problem. You, most of you have the brain issues that Dr. Gates is going to talk about. Would you say that's fibromyalgia kind of stuff? Yeah, encompasses it, absolutely. And the other problem is a lot of you have been tested for your thyroid and you're told it's normal. You've been tested for your adrenal glands and you're told that it's normal. Just keep in mind, go back to that one thing I mentioned to where there are hormones that come from the brain that talk to the thyroid. There are hormones that come from the brain that talk to the adrenal glands. And the really fascinating part for me is that a lot of fibromyalgia patients, they can inject those hormones that come from the brain to the thyroid or the adrenal glands, and the thyroid and the adrenal glands don't respond. They don't produce the hormones the way you would expect. But by the same token, it's not bad enough to be diagnosed as a horrible thyroid condition some of the time. It's not bad enough most of the time yeah, to so be diagnosed as a horrible adrenal gland condition like Addison's disease. Right. And then, but we're also seeing that the immune system is highly involved against the thyroid with a lot of fibromyalgia patients. So you can start to see how complex it is. And what Dr. Rutherford is saying when he's saying, you know, you can have a bad thyroid, you can have a bad adrenal glands, you can have functional hypercortisolism. That's this new thing out now. But they're saying the person doesn't have cushy English. Okay. So if the person has too much cortisol, cortisol is a stress hormone that tends to imbalance the immune system as well as. Uh, increasing blood sugar. That's why we have cortisol, so we can walk out into this desert here in Reno and sit there for 30 days as long as we have water, and we'll keep our blood sugar stable so our brain can function. But they're seeing now patients with fibromyalgia can have too much cortisol throughout the day, and that too much cortisol can be a bad thing relative to the immune system, relative to repairing the gut, relative to repairing skin. Um, and also, it can be hard on the brain. It can cause the person to kind of feel brain foggy. It can, or to have brain fog, it can cause them to not be able to remember as well as they would like to. So I think that explains it relative to the functional hypercortisolism. But they call it functional because the person doesn't have Cushing's disease. Cushing's disease patients have a moon face. They tend to be about 100 pounds overweight, and they have a pendulous abdomen. They get these purple streaks or stretch marks on their skin. But what we're seeing is that fibromyalgia patients can have the same or similar cortisol levels to a Cushing's patient, 
but they don't have Cushing's disease. So in other words, unless you're practically dead, you're not going to get diagnosed through right. the lab test. Exactly, exactly. So now and let's go to the brain. It's a little bit too late to, to bring you back, but yeah, yeah let's go. I, I, I would. So let's say this I would is. Think the brain. Let's say this is a knife. Is the most underappreciated aspect of agree. all chronic pain. I would agree, and that's and, why. And and this is why this is hugely important because it just seems like the literature is out there, but nobody seems to get it, and it is the cornerstone of the success of a lot of what our patients are able to accomplish here. So this is hugely important. Pay attention. Speak in English. Okay. <laughs> so let's say this was a knife, and accidentally that knife went into my hand. Let's say, let's hopefully say that it doesn't penetrate too far. But I get cut. I will have little pain nerves. They're called nociceptors. I'm sorry, but I have to make this distinction. All right. Well, you're fine. Okay. <laughs> Nociception or nociceptors are little nerves that transmit pain signals. But what you need to know, and if you have to keep rewinding this to get this, please do it. Because you have to know that it's not pain until it gets to your brain. It's not pain until it gets to your brain. So here it's nociception. And those nociceptive fibers will send signals up into my arm, up into my neck, up into my spinal cord, then up to my brain. Now, 75% of these signals actually will never make it up to the conscious part of the brain. They'll go to the subconscious part of the brain that doesn't really feel pain. With me on this? <laughs> you let me know if I'm doing okay relative to my lay explanation. So far, so good. Okay. So 75% will not make it to the conscious area of the brain. Only 25% make it to the conscious area of the brain. So that's a very, very important distinction because lots of times people say, I have so much pain in my muscles and there's so much going on. Well, really the problem is for many fibromyalgia patients is that Dr. Rutherford has these nociceptive fibers sending signals into his, his spinal cord and up to his brain. But, but, he, as much as I used to. but he's not feeling as much pain as he used to. Right. Largely because you can, less. you can shift the balance as to how many of these signals get through the spinal cord up to the brain. You can also shift the balance in terms of how much the brain is going to dampen out these signals coming to the brain. Does that make sense? When I started my treatment, by the way, when I started my search, I started with the brain right, and learned a number of very simple things at that mm -hmm. time. We're way more ahead of that and, and reduced my pain quite a bit based on what Dr. Gates is talking about right now. So know that it's all about the balance when you're feeling pain. If you're feeling pain all over your body and you've been diagnosed with fibromyalgia, most likely there's too much fuel in the fire, meaning you're feeling way too many of these pain neurons or nociceptive neurons coming into your, into your spinal cord and your brain is not shutting them off appropriately. That is the foundation. And from there, if you have a, a doctor who is skilled I'm not going to say it that way. Let's just say if you're seeing someone who's very uh, abreast with the fibromyalgia literature, then you can delve into the stress mechanisms, the immune mechanisms, the inflammatory mechanisms, the motor vehicle action mechanism, the pregnancy mechanism, all these other things that must have done something to shift that balance of increasing nociception or decreasing the, sh the mechanism shutting off the nociception coming into your Would it be fair to say if this mechanism wasn't working right that putting your socks on? would be painful for a lot of our fibromyalgia patients it, it is i mean some of them can't even work but, but i'm just saying the, i'm just the saying the mechanism person. itself that, that we have a natural mechanism to block out pain right the, this is I, what Dr. Gates is, yeah. is I don't feel the jacket on my back exactly and so if we didn't have this mechanism working and continually filtering out pain we'd be in pain all the time your mechanisms are being broken down and so you're feeling pain. And to the degree that they're breaking down, you're feeling more pain. And do you want to talk about, I think, here's another key when I talk to patients and they come in, I do the consults first to try to kind of kind of feel patients out and see if they're kind of, you know, maybe going to be comfortable with our program. Um, and one of the big things that seems to cognite with patients is the central sensitization. I mean, these people, I just people think they're crazy. Right. They think it's in their head. Right. And what Dr. Dace is saying, it kind of is in your head. <laughs> okay, because this is where you're sensing the pain. It's not in the muscle fibers. The problem's over here. The problem's not over here. But the central sensitization, um, and we're going to define that in a second, seems to really cognate with people. In other words, you feel pain much more than the average person feels pain. Yes, because the pain is now in your brain. 
the pain has become learned. Because that fake filter hasn't filtered it out. It's overwhelmed the brain to the point where the brain is now learning pain. You go back to, and I try to get too scientific on this, but we try to cut across the broad spectrum here. But, but, this, but we want you to know that we're not making this stuff up. Okay, and, and we utilize these methods and this data in our procedures, and it's pretty successful when you know what you're dealing with. And, and so, um, so just to go over that again, you have a pain mechanism that uh, is in place to filter out pain all the time. It gets broken down because of a number of other things, these 80 things that we talk about, uh, the and the stress and the, and, the, and the sexual abuse and the physical abuse and the, and the overwhelming infections and these things that build up. I, I mean, I could go on for an hour, but those things build up. They break this. They break the system down. Breaks down. Starts going into your brain. Now your brain starts to learn pain. It's good when you use your brain to learn 